at Teofilo Kinsani, what is surely wrong, the pronunciation. I think it's in Swahili. Uh, University at Mbeya. She's very engaged in women's work of her church. And I really don't know where she finds times to sleep because she has so many tasks to do. I'm wondering if you have more than three hours sleep a day. <clears throat> Our other guest is Dorcas Gordon. She is Principal Emeritus of the John Knox College in Canada and President of the International Association of Women's Ministry, founded 1919, I'm right? Great, great welcome. And we will see if the situation changed if you are looking at 1990 at, and 2022. We will have a look to it. First, I want to give uh, Mary Katagile the word to share your experiences from your Tanzanian context. Thank you, Magdalene. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for taking time to stop by as we discuss um, this topic, women's power beyond ordination. Um, being a pastor, I was ordained like uh, 13 years ago, and uh, I work in the Moravian Church, whereby the first woman to be ordained was ordained in two, the year 2000. And uh, right now we have a little bit more than 240 female pastors. And um, some, we have, the Moravian Church in Tanzania has eight provinces. Six out of the eight agreed to ordain women, and two have not agreed to ordain women. And um, when we speak of power of women, we, have, uh, we are talking about leadership, about leadership. And uh, in why? Simply because when you speak of power, we are talking about the position of influence. Now, these women who are ordained, some of them work in the congregations, but the majority work in different departments, such as Christian education and other places. Um, the positions of influence through the experience that I've seen First and foremost, there was a big kind of struggle and waiting for women to be ordained and accepted. Some of them were easily accepted in some congregations, but some of them until now, they struggle. They have challenges, and basically the root cause, one is cultural perspective, because in most of our cultures in Tanzania still, do not accept the leadership of women. Despite the fact now this is the second year we have a female president. So she has her own challenges as a leader. Now, uh, when we speak of power beyond ordination, the challenges that women have met often is that to be able to participate or to lead accordingly. I did say that in, we have eight provinces, and uh, in all eight, the executive leaders, there's no woman. And then uh, from the, these provinces, from the uh, hierarchical, you have the province, then you have the district, and then you have the lower up to the congregation. At the district level, out of chairpersons, 36, only two women are in that position of leadership. And uh, when you go lower, then you have women who lead the congregation, and some of them are only in departments. 
Um, maybe if I can speak a little bit about myself. I, after I graduated with my first degree, I was posted to teach at the Theological College. And um, I had to wait for 10 years before I could be ordained. The interesting part was that I was trusted to teach pastors, but I was not trusted to be a pastor myself. <laughs> so that also was, was a struggle. For me, I thought, well, my calling was to teach. So I thought when the time was right, I would be ordained. But women have been struggling. First and foremost, they are not really uh, counted for. It's like, yes, they are there. We have given them ordination, but they cannot lead us. So wherever they work, in con those in congregations, there is always a struggle. In other words, they make women have to prove themselves. Now, even if there is a slightest, slightest mistake we make, then it will be kind of blown that she has failed. And those who work in departments, no one bothers because especially Christian education, they go and teach in secondary schools and other schools, then nobody cares. But then uh, another challenge that women uh, beyond ordination first is that to be accepted with, with their fellow women. Because when it comes to top leadership, people become leaders through votes. So despite the fact that women are there, but they will not vote for their fellow women. So that's, that's another big challenge. But also it has been a, another challenge in the, the marital status, whereby um, I'm a counselor as well, so I see many female pastors have challenges in their marriages. Why? Because men are threatened by women leadership. Yeah, they feel like, well, now that you have become a pastor, you are a leader, and then life is not so, so peaceful either. So these are some of the challenges. But furthermore, in the, um, in the, uh, uh, in the church, there are still some people who think since Jesus Christ did not select a woman among the 12 disciples, then a woman should not be a leader. So these are some of the experiences that we experience on day to day. Uh, for my own experience, being a teacher, uh, teaching at the theological seminary, there are different challenges. Uh, this year I've reached 18 years since I started teaching, but there are some challenges as well. When I was appointed to be the dean, some of my fellow colleagues would not accept that. So when you call up the meeting, then it's like, you know, like a war whereby you will say something and then they will not agree and the likes. So these are kind of challenges. So when we speak of power, we are talking about the position of influence. But still, we are hopeful. Why? Because somehow situation is changing in some places. There are some people who do not really want to change. They feel like, well, the women cannot be accepted or cannot be trusted. So maybe to begin with, I will end there and then we'll continue later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for sharing your experiences with us. Uh, I also invited the leadership of your church to this workshop. Uh, maybe they have a business session. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> I'm wondering now what are your experiences, Dorcas? You are living in a quite different area, quite different culture, so I'm looking forward to your experiences. Thank you. And yet I think you'll hear similar themes as I speak uh, in terms of what Mary has been talking about. Uh, I'm part of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, which uh, de decided to ordain women in 1967. The first woman was ordained in 1968 after about a 15 to 18 year round of committees 
that couldn't come to a decision would be disbanded and another committee would be formed. But finally, in 67, the decision was made. Uh, so women celebrated and felt empowered. They now had arrived and could be ordained and equally serve in terms of their call to ministry with their fellow men. I went to seminary in 1969. So I was one of the first crop of women who went through just after ordination happened. And it wasn't very long before I realized that a number of my fellow students were not in support of this decision. Five women started in my year, and by second year, I was the only one left. Um, many of the men were really quite open in their opposition. The Bible, our ultimate standard for decision-making, spoke clearly, clearly against women being in leadership roles. My doctorate is in New Testament studies, so you can understand why after that. Uh, the great reform theological tradition spoke against it. You are a young woman. Are you here to get a husband? All of these things were part and parcel of my daily life, especially after my second year. The good news was, in the end, I made it through and uh, actually got the scholarship for the highest marks. Let me just scroll down here. And, uh, but even there, they couldn't leave it alone. One of my colleagues on the night of my convocation came up to me and said, well, you know, they probably gave it to you because you were the only woman in the class, not because you were actually better. This was just part and the parcel of life as a seminary student, but also women who were out there were experiencing the same kind of thing. Now, I want you to jump forward 12 years from the early 70s. A young man who was trained in a very conservative seminary in the United States came back to Canada and told the interview committee, the ordination interview committee, that on grounds of conscience, he would not participate in the ordination of a woman. This brought the whole issue of women's ordination back before the whole church. Those who were opposed in 1967, and now their young disciples, said that they should be able to claim the same prerogative to choose on the basis of conscience not to participate in services to ordain a woman. This struggle lasted for two years. Now, the church made the decision to reaffirm women's ordination and to deny the right to absent oneself on the basis of individual conscience. Now, it wasn't just in Canada that this happened. This same reevaluation took place also in Australia and also in the Church of Ireland, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And in the church in Australia, it was with devastating results because they revoked the right of women to be ordained. In Ireland, there was such a black backlash that for the next 30 years, until these men that were in seminary moved to their eternal reward, uh, very few women went through to be ordained in the ministry of the Presbyterian Church. Um, women in Canada felt abused and marginalized in this debate. All the old arguments were regurgitated and spewed out. It was like a physical assault, and it took time to recover. But then there was the next stage. I mean, that was still spewing forth all the arguments against women's right to ordination. But then we moved to another stage, which I think was just, is just as difficult, because I think it continues since it was no longer appropriate to openly oppose women's ordination, it was opposed subversively. I have watched it emerge again and again in the lives of my colleagues and my female students, more recently my young Korean women, as they shared their stories of meeting search committees. They wouldn't get the job and they'd say to me, well, you know, they told me that if I was a little stronger in preaching, they would have called me. Or if I could do that just a little better, then for sure I would be a serious contender. Or, or, or. 
And I, I agonized over this and wept with them because the real reason, more often than not, was gender. And many of these young women, the churches didn't want them because they were going to need time off to have babies. I mean, my goodness, think of that, real life in the church. Uh, again, the issue was it left many women unsure of themselves and their call to ministry. It created a, a lack of confidence in themselves as they went through this again and again. Now move to the year 1992, uh, the year that a woman became moderator of our General Assembly, which was the highest court in the church. Again, the abuse emerged, so much so that when she came out to moderate, she wore a Kevlar vest and we had police at every entrance to the assembly. There was such a concern that something was going to happen to her. Let me just say a little about my, my own experience. Um, um, I was nominated as principal of our largest seminary in 1999. I was well supported by the board, but my, nom my, my nomination stalled at the denominational review committee. Although I was a cradle Presbyterian, had been ordained for many years, served in congregational ministry, and had served in academic uh, administration, rumors abounded. There's something wrong with her Christology. Her theology must be weak. Maybe she's a Krista or Sophia follower. She's a feminist, you know. We have to be careful of her. Maybe it was my sexuality. I actually had a picture taken with myself, my husband, my four kids, and splayed that on the website. The only thing I didn't have was a dog. I was <laughs> thinking of borrowing one, but I didn't go that far. Maybe there was something wrong with my morality. I mean, all of these things were just circulating. In the end, I was appointed. Although one of my colleagues said to me, do you know that it took longer to approve your um, becoming the principal of Knox College than it did to, to pass a subordinate standard of faith? <laughs> if you can believe it. Um, the, the issue, and here's where it hit me personally. I, I was appointed, but the struggle took its toll, leading me to work far too hard trying to prove that I was worthy of the position. Only gradually did I come to accept that the problem was not me, but something that I couldn't and wouldn't for the life of me change, the fact that I was a woman. My 18 years as principal, I did hang around for quite a while once they appointed me. I figured I went through such a struggle that I'd stay put for a while. My 18 years as principal was a time of actually great learning for me. I learned that I should continue to reflect on my early enculturation as a girl child in a traditional Irish minister's family, where every action was subject to critique by the whole congregation. How many of you have grown up in a minister's household or a manse? It's quite an experience. You feel like there's no walls on your home, that everybody can see everything you're doing. In that context, I realized that I had learned to be cautious careful not to assume too much authority or too much leadership. I remember being part of a, a big event where I was to uh, moderate one of the significant groups in this. And we gathered in our group, and all of a sudden this man started talking. And he said, we don't have a leader. We don't have a leader. And I said, I'm the leader. And at that point, I was eight months pregnant. And he just sort of looked at me and looked at my stomach and then wasn't sure what to do. But anyway, um, but, but that's the kind of thing that continues to happen. So in, in the context of a minister's family, I learned I was equal to the boys, but not quite. And these distinctions I learned long before I had the vocabulary to name such a distorted view. Continued reflection on this enculturation has helped excuse me, help me create a robust sense 
of agency. So I think that's important for women in ministry, to take seriously that enculturation, because it can pop up when you least expect it um, and cause you to be less than confident. So for example, I gradually learned to trust my intuition. After all, my father was a minister. I'd learned church politics at the din dinner table. I knew and could read church culture. But even so, I would find myself questioning this kind of knowledge only to discover in hindsight that my so-called women's intuition really... As principal, I learned that there were aspects of my way of administering the college that I needed to reevaluate. It wasn't just everybody else's fault. There were things that I really needed to continue to look at. I knew in principle that different criteria existed by which the actions of women and men were judged. It was another thing to experience it. To hear criticism that my consensus model of leadership was criticized as being a weakness. Didn't she know her own mind? Come on, what's wrong with her? Can't she make a decision here? While the same style exercised by my predecessor was Pray, oh, look at this six foot three man. He is so consensual. This is wonderful. Anyway, be, be ready for things like that. Over the years, and I think this was the thing that helped me most, I'm a biblical scholar, a feminist scholar, and one of my great principles is a hermeneutics of suspicion. And over the years, as principal, I developed a robust hermeneutics of suspicion about what was true and where truth might lie. I realize that I'm part of an older generation and that women in my context might say it's really not like that anymore. I recognize the truth of that to a certain extent, but I hope some of what I've shared may be helpful to other women in other contexts where ordination to ministry is much more recent. I'll end there. I could tell you a whole bunch of stories, but I'll stop. Thank you so much, Dorcas and Mary, for sharing these experiences. When I was listening to you both, I was asking myself, what's going wrong in this world? Two really different cultures, but the same obstacles, the same barriers, the same reactions of, of men, of, of the family, of what else. What is wrong? And why it's in every culture discrimination against women? Cultures are very different, but they are united in discriminating women. And the next question is coming to the topic of religion. You both mentioned the Bible and the, uh, some Bible verses, and <laughs> you learned how to deal with them and to reread the, the histories and, and the Bible verses. Also, in, in, in the Christian faith, is discrimination against women, violence against women. And even if you are looking at other religions, you find the same. They may be very different in their dogmatic system, but coming to the question of gender, they all agree. So it, for me, it's really uh, one of the main questions. What do you think about it, Mary? And then I come to you. Thank you very much, Magdalene. Um, In our context, I would say, is the upbringing. When we speak of culture, it's known uh, that a woman, first and foremost, she is a daughter to her father. And then, uh, then she's a sister of somebody. And then she's the wife of somebody. So in other words, that brings a picture that the woman has to be under a certain man in her life. 
And then um, in our culture, a woman, there is the division of roles, gender roles. But these gender roles in our context become more oppressive on women because a woman can do this and this and this. And in some tribes, it's even it's so difficult for a woman to, to answer if someone knocks the door if the man is inside. Yes, that means he has, I mean, come to your house. I say, well, Dorcas, Dorcas, Dorcas. If your husband is there, he has to tell you that you can answer. Or else you cannot. But why simply this is the power, power thing? He controls you. So what's the problem? I would say this upbringing, maybe, or the influence of culture that a woman's place is there. Now, in trying to uh, penetrate or to, to go beyond that when you come to leadership or position of power, that becomes challenging. Challenging not only to men, but also to the people around us. Um, it wasn't easy for me to being a girl out of seven, seven children, five boys and two girls, and then um, growing in the village and that kind of life. So the first time when I said I want to go and study to be a pastor, it was like, what? You know, that's a man's job. So people were able to, you know, my relatives, my uncles also said, why? Why? Why can't you go be a teacher? So in other words, this is something when it comes to matters of faith, they feel like matters of faith, a woman cannot lead. Because the woman can be a banker, manager of the banker, can be a district officer or anything like that. But then when it comes to matters of faith, this is a different story. So it becomes even more oppressive to a woman when you try to go that later to go and, uh, and be ordained. But uh, then what is the problem? I would say the culture, the upbringing, and misinterpretation of the Bible. Because you would expect that uh, uh, these kind of things would happen to those people who do not know the Bible. But then people know the Bible, but they have their own of thinking. They don't read the Bible according to the context, but rather they say, for example, the example of the 12 disciples. It's like, well, it's there. There were only 12 and there were only men, and he was the man, and full stop. <laughs> and full stop. <laughs> No, they don't go that far. <laughs> they, don't, they don't go far that far. So this, this, is, this is something. But then, uh, in our context, then, they are our fellow women. Though, because those can also really, really bring such a position, you know. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, you know, vote for you and the likes. Maybe out of ten, you get three to support you but seven will not support you. So I, I don't know what's the problem. So these are the, the challenges that uh, when I was the dean of the faculty of theology, uh, after appointment, and the, the faculty has uh, nine teachers, and I was the only woman. And uh, I could hear scholars, you know, my fellow scholars would say, well, are we going to be led by a woman? Prior to that, I was the head of library. And that was okay. <laughs> that was okay. But then it, it changed. So I think it's just the mentality or upbringing or anything like that. Thank you. I've got a dozen and one things running through my head, but they're in no logical order. So I'm not sure what's going to come out when I talk. I just blame the church fathers. Because what they did was they divided. We started, and we still have this system of binaries, right? Darkness, light, sin, um, truth, you know, all of that, women, men. Totally, we live in a binary world, and we've got to reframe that world. I think that's our only chance for really moving away from some of these cultural, etc., pieces. So you remember the church fathers. 
Uh, men were logical of the head. Women were of nature, so they ran around, I guess, naked. I don't know what they did, but obviously they had something in their heads that uh, they didn't like. And so, therefore, women were seen as fanciful. It was tied into women's life cycle mm -hmm. of uh, menstrual babies and all of that, but that made them less than once this head uh, nature duality came into being. So that's, that's one thing that has continued. Now, the interesting thing is, even in cultures that are matriarchal, uh, my friend Isabel Peary, who's here at the WCC, she comes from Malawi, and Malawi's a matriarchal culture. And she said, darn those missionaries, because they came with their patriarchal culture, with their Bible, and all of a sudden we were a patriarchal culture. So that's, that's another little piece of how, how things can change. Um, where was I going with all of that? Uh, let, let me talk, let me pull, come into more recent time. Mary talked about women and how women can sometimes be the ones that are most against you. And I think that's to do with informal power. Because for, for so many years and centuries, women weren't allowed to exercise power. It was all the males. And so they learned very effectively how to exercise informal power. And there's nothing as dangerous as informal power because you don't know where it's coming from or how it's going to impact you. I saw it when my husband and I went into team ministry. It was really kind of uh, funny, sort of. But um, that took, it took the Women's Association a long time to really accept my ministry. And I thought, what the heck's going on here? What's wrong with them? Well, then I began to watch what was going on to see just what was happening. And I realized that they were able to control my husband in certain ways through the exercise of this informal power. And I remember we had a heart-to-heart -heart one night, which didn't go so well, but we did have it. Uh, and uh, I said, you're going to have to stop allowing that to happen. Otherwise, I'm never going to be able to come in and exercise the kind of leadership that we wanted to model because we were a team ministry. So that, that was another piece coming out of what Mary said. I think I'll stop there. My, my head's swirling. But, uh, and I gave you some, some um, stories about I have four kids, and I was in ministry. The, the first one was born before I started ministry. But, I mean, I've traveled the country pregnant and nursing and remember all these great stories about being in a little congregation and had to go downstairs to nurse the baby before the service. He needed to be fed. So I was downstairs very discreetly nursing my child. And this man comes running downstairs. He says, I don't think we have a minister this morning. We have no minister this morning. And I went, I went, I'm the minister? And he looked at me, and then he looked down, and he hightailed it out of the room. I don't even think he came to church. I didn't see him after that. Anyway, these are, these are just funny stories, but they're part of how difficult women's life cycle is at times in terms of the kind of leadership role uh, that we, we have within the church. Anyway, let me leave it at that. Maybe a last question before <laughs> I open to the audience. Mary, you are a member of a church and you are very engaged in the church. You are engaged for gender advocacy. Uh, you are engaged for women's work, uh, giving courses for pastors, female pastors. What gives you the strength, the hope to remain in this patriarchal church? Uh, what enables you? What, uh, yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, first and foremost, you know, experience makes you understand what other people go through. Uh, it took years and hardships for me to rediscover myself and to depend on God, that God can use me as I am. And this was a transformational uh, position whereby I developed the, the idea or the understanding that God can use any, anyone, 
be it a woman or a man. And uh, for that matter, after rediscovering myself, um, my husband passed away. He was also a pastor. Passed away when I was in my second year of study when I was doing my bachelor and left me with seven children. Yes, and all of them were still in school. So long story short, it was difficult. <laughs> it wasn't easy. And then uh, we had a good marriage. I would say perfect. And then uh, upon his death, uh, his family wanted to take everything, you know, everything and uh, just leave me with children, but they wanted to take everything. So all those kind of things, they were bitter pill for me, but they, it was a transformational period, I would say. Rediscovering to be strong that, well, this is it. I have to face it. To be it difficult, I have to do it. So after that, by the grace of God, I've been able to, to move one step at a time, one day at a time, until my children now are all grown up, and they, they all have, seven, uh, have first degrees, and praise be to God. So after going through that, I realized that there are potentials in women. And therefore, that's why I'm so much involved. I wish to encourage women, to empower them, to help them understand that first and foremost, they are worthy and they can work according to God's will and purpose in their lives. And therefore, I run many seminars, many counseling or workshops and writing and all those. And gender justice is, has been um, <clears throat> in my mind throughout. Now, in our context, we have some challenge, injustices that is happening in, in the society. Uh, it's not easy for a woman to inherit what her father has left or the husband has left, but also the ownership of land or whatever and things like that. So the, all these kind of things, I feel like uh, women need to know, need to know that they are human beings just like men. And then they are able, they should be able to understand that it's my right to inherit what my husband left or anything in that line. But furthermore, the violence, the piece of violence, violence against women. I struggled for a long time to empower women to reach to the place where they can say no to violence. Uh, we still have cultures whereby when a woman is battered, then feels that the way of life. She can put up with those kind of issues. But then my struggle is to empower this woman to say, no, <laughs> this is not right. I am a human being. I'm not, I don't need to be violated for any circumstances. So this has been a process. And uh, indeed, I work day and night to make sure that I, <laughs> I share, <laughs> I share the, you know, what I know and help women, uh, empower them, educate them, and the likes. So that's it. Thank you. And maybe a question for you, um, Dorcas. You are the former president of the International Association of Women's Ministry. Where do you see the main challenges of your associations? What are you facing with? I've got about four members of them here right now. They could probably talk as well as I can. I, I think uh, the founder of our movement was a real rebel. She went around the country just like a suffragette. You know, she'd go anywhere. She wouldn't stop. And she, she was called all sorts of crazy names and, and everything. And I, I think being most of the members are from North America, and so I think we can we become a little complacent at times. So one of the things we talked about at our meeting that was just over was aligning ourselves with associations of women who are ordained in various parts of the world to begin to hear those stories and to begin to maybe look more carefully at our own contexts 
um, because there are women in ministry, ordained ministry, there are a lot of women in ordained ministry. As ministry becomes hard, the men leave and leave it to the women. It, I mean, it, it happens. There's increasingly more and more women uh, coming into ministry and fewer and fewer men. So, um, so anyway, that's one thing about the association. And certainly Marion, who was the previous president before me, might have something to add to that as well. But I think it's it's aligning ourselves with other women in different parts of the world and having common conversations about what our life is like as ordained women and what it means to be leaders because different cultures lead differently. And I think there's a lot of learning there that we could do. Um, I was interested, if I could just say one thing about Mary was saying that in her culture, it's all right for women to become politicians or to become bankers or to become that. And I think this is a caution for all of us, is that that's true. The hardest thing to overcome is in ministry and the church because the Bible is seen to be divinely ordained. I mean, that you can, you can start your arguments wherever you want and there's somebody that says, but you're just misinterpreting that. I mean, because God, it says it right there, and I keep saying, you're reading it in English. Read it in Greek, and I'll listen to you, but not in English. And can I just answer your question about Mary? For me, what's kept me going is trying to develop a sense of humor, is trying to, to really go lightly with some of this. It hurts, and it's been hard, but, well, you hear me. I kind of try to twist things and figure ways. I love teaching because I had done like eight years of Greek and I had my doctorate. And so I would have people come up to me and say, well, that's not how it is. And I said, well, let me sit down and we'll go over the Greek together, okay? <laughs> or in church, when I didn't like a text particularly, I would just retranslate it. And it got to be that was just accepted because, they, well, she knows, she knows her Greek. I did it with Hebrew too, but I don't know my Hebrew very well. So, <laughs> but I think, I think what I'm trying to say is that for me, it's trying to stand loose to all of the hassles, because there are a lot of them, and to keep a, a sense of humor. God has called me, for goodness sakes, and God knows what God's doing, and I'm going to keep right on going. And I'm retired now. I don't know why I'm talking like this. I don't have to do it. But uh, anyway, that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you so much to you both. Maybe you have questions, comments, own experiences you want to share with. Oh, okay. I don't, I'm not ordained, but I have worked in the church for the last 27 years. And I have worked with reverend ministers. And about three or four years back, I had a project, Women in Governance, in the church. And one objective was that the church needs to create an enabling environment for women to be able to do what they do. Indeed, I'm an Anglican, and even if I wanted to be ordained, my bishop would not allow it. And I didn't even want to be ordained because I wanted to speak truth to them. Once I put on the collar, they would tell me, uh, taking the ecclesiastical oath so I can't speak to them. So I preferred to do what I am doing, and I'm doing it well. The issue then happened. There was a church, and I asked them, when will we ever see a female moderator? Because when I look at the Presby Church, the women in the Presby Church are better than the men in terms of speaking and preaching. They are better. And a, pre a reverend minister told me, not in my lifetime. So it is a calculated thing to the extent that when a woman was put forward as a moderator, she was voted against by women, saying that uh, her marriage is not good, the husband is somewhere, and she has no child. So it was the point of entry for me to do education to the women and happily they voted another woman in in power uh, it, it is that you have to be consistent it is that you have to be passionate and to tell them 
And that is why some of them are there to support those who are wearing the collar. I am not going to wear the collar. So some of us should be doing what we are doing to support the women. Thank you very much. I'm very happy with what went on. Thank you for sharing this with us. Sorry, I came in late, but uh, just the question around, uh, maybe a comment around, uh, we actually had uh, one of our, in the Pacific, we had a Women Theologians Dialogue uh, in April this year. And I think one of the issues that came out very strongly was women not supporting women um, in the church. Uh, this includes uh, the pastor's wife not supporting women ordained, you know, working in their... Uh, in their constituents, and also women within the church, not supporting women ordained ministers or women in leadership in churches. How, maybe we just need to have some conversation or suggestions on how we build solidarity amongst women in the churches to support women ordained or women in leaderships. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the conversation. I'm so much encouraged. I am yet to be ordained. I'm a theologian. I did my master's uh, in uh, divinity, but nobody in my church recognizes that. And uh, be simply because I look like a threat among the men. Um, you said that there was a person who said, until I die. We had a bishop who said, um, if you want to ordain women, wait until my death. That was 1992. Thank God that the, the bishop, yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm like, thank God that I was there when he mentioned that. And it was 1992 when I joined the um, Mennonite Church in Tanzania. I grew up in Anglican Church, but I got married to uh, uh, a pastor of uh, Tanzania Mennonite Church. And my call, was there since when I was young. After senior six, I just told my parents I want to be a pastor. And guess what? Nobody in my family supported my call. So somebody came to my family and said, Esther, if you want to be a pastor, come, follow me. So I went, he took me to the big hospital. and said, you see this? I said, yeah, that is the hospital. But I am called to work in the church. He said, if you want to serve the Lord, you can still be a nurse and you can save the people. So I was like, okay, maybe. By then, my parents wanted me to go for teachers and I refused that. I say, I'm called to be the pastor. I want to go for the um, <laughs> Bible college. I did all the uh, process to attend the Bible college, but nobody accepted me. So when that pastor said, I say, okay, maybe that, and I accepted. I went for the training as a nurse. I started working. I took that position to be so dear because I knew now this is my church. And every time I could claim that I am going to my church, but I could preach to the sick people and started uh, doing the work every day until everybody started calling me a pastor. Then I say, yes, I am a pastor. To cut the story short, when, um, when I was 50 years old, that is when my husband went for the study, and I was called to follow him, you know, in Tanzania. Mennonite Church, if your husband is a pastor and goes for school, after one year you have to accompany him. So they called me, it was in the USA, when I visited, and then they said, oh, you can stay, you have a house and everything. Then I say, no. If I want to stay here, I better go for study. They say, okay, here is the catalog. Which course would you do? I chose the course. So when I had started, um, it was a long way to go for the church to get the, I mean, the stamp that I, I should join the seminary. It was also a tug of war. But finally, they accepted me. When I joined the course, a pastor who was holding a very big position in the church visited me in the USA seriously and told me, Esther, you are lost. 
why are you studying the seminary? Do you think you are going to be ordained? I said, well, I'm not studying to be ordained, but I want to study this theology. He, say, he said, you are a nurse. Why can't you just do the, um, upgrade yourself into your professional? I said, I want to study this, and I'm going to do the divinity so that when I go back to Tanzania, I will show the pastors that I, women also can study. So I studied. I graduated. And now I'm waiting for my caller to be ordained. I'm so much encouraged. That bishop died. Then I went back and said, okay, bishop so-and-so died because, <laughs> and said, when you people are you going to ordain women? Nobody listened to me. There was a, another person in the position said, we need to revisit this. We need to think about it. This year, in January, it's when they accepted women to be ordained. So as I am speaking, <laughs> thank you. Six of us were voted for. You know, for you to be ordained, they need to vote. So when they sit down and vote, you have to get 75%. So I'm like, okay, I did the study. I have graduated. I'm a theologian. Then you vote for what? I know my call, but they have to vote. So they voted for six of us. Um, two of us were married to the ministers. Here comes another challenge. This is the bishop's wife. How are we going to ordain her? And to be ordained, you have to begin with the deacon position. They changed the, the constitution to, to, to allow women to be ordained. That constitution says they should be accepted in deacon position. So they say, okay, this one is a theologian. If you put her into the deacon, now is it not a demotion? So I am still having a long way to go. I told them, yes, it is a deacon. All I want is the authority to be ordained. You know, ordination has that power. You are given the power to lead. But if you are not ordained, that means you have no that authority. Yes, you have, you have your degree, but you can just keep it there and nobody will accept it. We still have a long way to, do, to go. Mary, thank you so much for your testimony. And Dorcas, I'm so much encouraged. I am still pushing on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe a last contribution before we have to come to an end. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Cynthia Walton Levitt. I'm the secretary of the International Association of Women Ministers. One of the things we are working on is how can we support our sisters around the world? Those of us in my tradition, we've been ordaining women since 59 or 56. I was ordained in 79. As a young pastor, I was doing a wedding. The women wanted to know what was I bringing to the reception? I said, I did the wedding. <laughs> and, you know, well, and I'm not a good cook. So they said, well, maybe a vegetable dish. But at any rate, so, you know, but that, that was back in like 1980, probably, after, our, you know, the first summer I was or, ordained. It takes a long time. And we are in different cultures. And one of the things that we do not know in North America is to support how well and how do we support you who are in different places in the world? So we hope to grow our organization and help you teach us and remind us to keep our mouths shut sometimes and just listen. Okay? Because we need to listen and learn from all of you as to how we can help. Because our, our purpose is to promote, to encourage, and to celebrate women in ministry. How do we help promote, encourage, and celebrate women in your context who are called to ministry? Please help us. Thank you. Mary, Mary maybe you could give an answer. What would you help and women in, in your context? Thank you very much for all the contributions. Uh, what I would say that we... First and foremost, we need to pray for each other. And then uh, we need to educate 
empowering through education, capacity building, and the likes. Because you see, if you are all alone, you feel like you are so frustrated. But if you know that there are my sisters somewhere praying and supporting me, that gives you strength. So thank you. That is one, of, as Cynthia is reminding me, that is one of the things that we do do. We have what's called a prayer calendar. And so all of the women who are members of the association, um, we, we, have, we promise to pray for them once each year. So they're on a sort of a weekly roster right through the year. And uh, prayer is a big thing. Uh, just, and I've got so many emails back from women during my time as president saying, oh, thank you. Thank you. That was great to know that somebody was thinking of me on that particular day. Um, so, Time is running, so we have to come to an end, a formal end, but we are free to talk, to discuss the whole night. <laughs> Mary's used to it, and Torcas as well. Uh, Please stay with us, we, we can discuss, or you can have bilateral talk with the two of, with uh, Mary and Dorcas. I thank Mary for your sharing and for your very personal sharing of your story to encourage other women in their way. And also thank you to you, Dorcas, you did a good fight, <laughs> and this is encouraging. <laughs> no, <laughs> this is really encouraging for other women who have to fight for uh, th that they get ordained or become a leader or a leader position. Thank you so much, you both. Thank you. I have to run off in a few minutes because I've got another meeting because um, so tomorrow night the World Communion of Reformed Churches is having an event where they have made the ordination of women a status confessionis, which means that you go to hell if you don't accept women's ordination. <laughs> they didn't say that, I did. If I knew, I'd tell you.